Now, what if it is in that middle range? In fact, even if it isn't, we don't need to stop with just fasting insulin. Insulin is volatile. It changes. So are there markers that are a little more stable? There are, albeit now we get into the realm of a little indirect with this one, but it is surprisingly accurate. And that is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. The triglyceride divided by HDL number. So you take your fasted triglycerides, which you get at every blood test. That's the benefit of this. It's not common to get insulin measured at a blood test, whereas we always will get our lipids measured. So you look at your blood test and you see your triglycerides, and then you divide triglycerides by the HDL number, and you always get HDL cholesterol. That will give you this ratio. And if it is less than 1.5, that's a really good sign. If it's above 1.5, that starts to get into the realm of being troublesome. It's a little problematic. Um, so you'd want to be a little more cautious and assume that you have some degree of insulin resistance. So that's the triglyceride to HDL ratio. Now, the last test that I want to mention, remember, and we're all just kind of framing the conversation of how to fix insulin resistance. But again, my purpose in having this bit of a pre- Quill tangent is to help you understand where you're at. The last one is my favorite one, which is called the Adipo IR score. Adipo just for adipose. So it's the adipose insulin resistance score. This is a test that is looking at the insulin resistance at the fat cells. Now, why does that matter? Do you recall from our earlier conversation of the tissue that I said likely starts insulin resistance throughout the body. When you have this progressive and uh, steady insulin resistance that's creeping into the person's life throughout the years, I submit that it's the fat tissue that becomes insulin resistant first. And thus, if you have a way of determining insulin resistance at the fat tissue, then you are detecting it potentially at its earliest possible stages. That's what the adipose insulin resistance score will tell us. Now, something that's so interesting about this is just the elegance of the biochemistry of what's happening at the fat cell or the, the biology of the fat cell. Now, we know that the fat houses, fat cells house this big droplet, I mean, relatively big, microscopically big, but big by cell standards, a big bubble of fat, if you will. And insulin is largely the signal, not the only one, is a primary signal that's influencing the growing or the shrinking of that, what's called a lipid droplet, that big bubble of fat within the fat cell. If insulin is elevated, it is preventing the fat cell from breaking down its fat through a process called lipolysis. Insulin inhibits lipolysis. Now, the product of lipolysis or the evidence of lipolysis in the blood is something called free fatty acids, also sometimes referred to as non-esterified fatty acids. They're the same thing. FFAs or NEFAs, it's the same. I'm just going to call them free fatty acids to cut out a couple syllables for the sake of the discussion. So if insulin is elevated, free fatty acids should be down because insulin is inhibiting lipolysis. In contrast, if insulin is down, through, say, a fasted state or low-carb diet, then you'd expect free fatty acids to be higher because insulin is not present to inhibit lipolysis. And that's indeed what you'd get. Uh, so high insulin should be leading to reduced free fatty acids. Low insulin would lead to elevated free fatty acids. That's what this test is attempting to determine. The two parts of this formula is fasted insulin and fasted free fatty acids. Now, measuring free fatty acids is not common. It can be done, but it is not a common test. So you'd have to either go in and pay for it directly at LabCorp or Quest or something, um, or convince your clinician to check that box and hope, hope your insurance will cover it. But it's a fascinating test. Um, one of the reasons I'm so fascinated in it is its, it's sensitivity of actually indicating metabolic problems. Now, I'm going to come back. I'm not done with this, but as an example, one of the very first papers I ever saw that used this study was looking at the degree of insulin resistance in healthy, in otherwise healthy women who had PCOS. So they had women with, in without, with and without polycystic ovary syndrome. So two groups of ladies controlled for age and even body weight and body fat. So they were the same overall body type. And yet in, in, in the women with PCOS in this particular study, they did not detect 
they did not see signs of whole body insulin resistance. But when they looked at the fasted insulin in combination with the fasted free fatty acids, then, or in other words, the adipo IR score, they detected a significant increase in these, in these women with PCOS. So the insulin resistance wasn't even manifesting at the level of the whole body, but it was evident at the level of the first tissue that becomes insulin resistant, namely the fat tissue. So if you've gotten those numbers, fasted insulin in micro units per mil, and the, 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 the units are important here. So micro units per mil, and you multiply that number, fasted insulin in micro units per mil times free fatty acids in millimole. Now, thankfully, that's going to be millimole anywhere in the world. So that's going to be a, a pretty consistent unit. And you want that number to be below a certain cutoff, but it's different for men and women. Now, another little tangent here to explain why. At any given moment, women will have a free fatty acid level in her blood that can be up to 40 or even 50% higher than it is in a man. So if a man is manifesting with um, a free fatty acid of one millimolar, his healthy female counterpart is very likely going to be one and a half millimolar free fatty acids. Women are constantly mobilizing fat from her fat cells much more than her male counterparts. And that's entirely a product of sex hormones, particularly the estradiols, um, or sorry, estrogens, estradiol being the main one, the estrogens. Estrogens are promoting this higher rate of turnover of the fat cells. So at any moment, there's more fat coming out of the fat cell. And indeed, at any moment, a female is burning more fat. This will be the topic of another, of a future metabolic classroom. Um, but suffice it to say, women are fat burning machines relative to her male counterparts. Now, of course, the woman is rolling her eyes thinking, well, why do I have more fat? Because you're also putting more in to those fat cells, but again, you're taking more out. So there's that's where I, what I meant by the higher turnover, more going in, but more coming out. And that's evidenced as the higher free fatty acids. So what are the cutoffs? In a man, that adipo IR score is ideally less than five. If his adipo IR score is less than five, that suggests that his fat tissue is insulin sensitive. In a woman, that cutoff is eight. It's higher. She has a little more room there because her free fatty acids are naturally higher. Men and women will have generally similar levels of insulin, um, but when it comes to free fatty acids, no, not similar. Females will be higher because they're fat burning machines because of the estrogens. And so her adipo IR score has to account for that and thus the cutoff is higher. So women, if it's less than eight, thumbs up. Your fat tissue is insulin sensitive. Men, if it's less than five, thumbs up. High five, you're doing well.